everyone. I'm Peter McMillan, Executive Officer NT Shelter, and we're broadcasting today from Larrakia country in Darwin. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to any other First Nations people who may be watching on. Sharing the Couch is a conversation with thought leaders in the housing and homelessness system, whether they're local in the Northern Territory or further afield, and those that are really making a difference at the pointy ending in our, in our housing and homelessness system. The theme of sharing the couch is inspired by the uh, Youth Homelessness Matters Day, the couch surfing events here in Darwin at Anglicare NT sponsors each year. And as a tribute to the young kids that raise couches, and it's also an opportunity to reflect on uh, youth homelessness and the fact that we need to do more to end homelessness. We've got a number of people lined up to talk over the coming weeks, and we're gonna get to know a little bit more about what they do, uh, what they're striving to achieve, and some of the awesome work that they're doing. Today, it's a pleasure to have on our program, Dave Pugh. Dave has spent three decades, over three decades actually, working in the nonprofit sector. And prior to his current role as CEO of Anglicare NT, was the Chief Executive Officer of St. Luke's Anglicare in Bendigo, where Dave spent 23 years and was well known for his community leadership and vision. And he's well known here as well for his community leadership and vision. Dave's vision for Angular Care is to see delivering consistently effective services that make a lasting change in the lives of Territorians that may need support. He's committed to ensuring that Angular Care NT is strongly linked to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and communities. He believes that Angular Care NT as a faith-based agency has a significant role in contributing to fairness, respect and community. Dave is an experienced leader that's driven by values-based management principles. Throughout his career, he's always been passionate about building community relationships and helping bring about positive, lasting change. Dave Pugh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. It's great to share the couch with you today. And I guess I'd just like to start um, uh, going back to when you left school in Victoria, down there in mm -hmm. Kew. Um, and went to study agriculture and uh, did very well at that actually, had an honours degree I see in, in agriculture and applied science and then went on to study teaching. So you, what was the story there? You, didn't, you found out that agriculture wasn't right for you or, or what was happening then? Look, I think as a young fellow, whatever you do when you finish high school is kind of um, just a maturing process, isn't it? But it does reflect something about values. For me, it does. Um, I was keen to address global poverty. Um, and so I thought agricultural science was a path to that. Uh, ends up falling in love uh, with a woman who wanted to teach in remote Aboriginal communities. And so I, I did a teaching qualification so I could join her in remote work. Um, and, we, um, and so that led to an amazing uh, op opportunity to come to the Northern Territory in the early 1980s and to uh, experience work uh, in, in remote Northern Territory. And I sometimes think that uh, being able to understand the work of poverty and disadvantage, particularly in the Northern Territory, it, it, it's very helpful to have an insight into the urban challenges that people have, um, but also into, into remote uh, Northern Territory. There's nothing, nothing like it. And um, of course, remote Northern Territory has uh, incredible uh, gift to to non-Aboriginal people in that in that uh, many people living in remote communities uh, have got a, a really strong connection to that 65,000 year history, and um, and on top of the incredible uh, history, the, uh, I, I experienced a great warmth and generosity from Aboriginal people towards me and. So I think that was a, a really wonderful foundation for a, a career that's been quite focused, not only on disadvantage, but also on people's strengths and what people bring to their, their journey. And, um, and, and in, in any setting, I, I did a lot of work, Peter, in um, working with adults with mental illness. And it was so easy to sometimes get into a space that uh, other professionals did that said uh, people with mental illness, uh, you, uh, we, we could focus on their deficits. And what was um, exciting for me, having had that experience in remote Aboriginal work was actually, of course, 
people uh, people with mental illness are not defined just by that. They've got all kinds of other experience, knowledge, and um, and strengths. And so uh, I really uh, have found through my career the opportunity to, to to live and breathe both people's challenges, but also their great capacities to solve their own issues has been, uh, I think, central to my approach. Wonderful. So you've um, you've fallen in love. That's that's wonderful, and you've still managed to get that uh, honors degree through, and then go straight into teaching. So uh, that must have been a real commitment at the time, and I guess also um, quite a change for you to think. Well, teaching as a pathway to, I guess, um, coming to the territory or doing something um, um, quite different. Do you act, did you actually enjoy your time teaching over there at Nullum Boy when you first came up? Uh, teaching is an interesting, I think it's another apprenticeship. In fact, uh, I remember a book at the time when I was working in schools uh, that talked about 100 careers for teachers um, because there's a foundation for teachers. I really respect people who've come through the teaching profession now uh, because I've seen them, um, they're often very good at planning mm -hmm. and uh, you have to be pretty organised with your time. Um, and you have to be really clear about what is the end that you're trying to achieve. So begin with the end in mind, as um, we know from Seven Habits. Um, and I think we uh, also see that teachers often have to distill information and communicate. So it probably gave me a bit of confidence in, in, in speaking. In fact, I got some feedback from staff recently saying, yeah, you're doing a pretty good job, Dave, but can you just make your speeches a bit shorter? <laughs> That explains a few things today, Dave. You're very concise. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like when you arrived at uh, Nullum Boy um, and took on a role of teaching? It must have been quite a shock. Uh, it, not a shock as in a negative shock necessarily, but quite a culture shock coming from Melbourne to a school classroom in Nullum Boy. What was it like? Uh, look, I think overall, I'd have to say it was an embracing an uh, amazing experience. Of course, as you know, Pete, living in the Northern Territory is incredible incredibly uh, beautiful and so we're surrounded by beauty and, and, and an amazing climate so that was good uh, I was able to uh, I was pretty pretty uh, full-on about this experience and so not only were we experiencing the beauty we also started learning Aboriginal language and um, and, and, and got involved in, in trying to understand um, an Aboriginal worldview pretty quickly. And that was just a joy, um, actually. So mm. teaching has its downsides. Every Anyone standing in front of a, a group of uh, um, highly charged hormonal adolescents knows that it's not necessarily all, all uh, easy, mm. um, but, it, but overall it was incredible. I, I found myself pretty quickly leaning towards the community services side of teaching and so got involved in... Um, in trying to find uh, new new programs to address young people who are a bit disengaged, uh, mm. and so it was a that was a, a kind of a natural transition for me from teaching into community services. I was going to say from from there you went across to Millingimby to work with the Aboriginal Advisory Development Service, uh, and so yeah, do, <clears throat> how did that come about? And, and I know. Um, you're going again from teaching into community service quite a long way from from your a few years earlier when you finished as a as an agriculture graduate. Um, again, how did how did that how did you feel about that transition? Was that was that something you were looking for, or was that an opportunity that came up and you thought, how long is it going to take it? Uh, no, I really was actively um, thinking about how do I apply the skills and passions I have to uh, to the community needs that I see and. Uh, having done agricultural science, I was aware that in some of the uh, remote Aboriginal communities, there had been uh, the establishment of community gardens and uh, um, and uh, various efforts to find sustainable living and food production. And so I contacted the um, uh, Aboriginal Advisory Development Service at the time and said, you know, is there a role for someone with agricultural science background? And they said, not really, but we are just starting. It was the period not long after a famous prime minister of Australia called Gough Whitlam, who had really advanced a movement called the 
the outstation movement and was investing federal money in supporting Aboriginal people to go from the congregated areas of what used to be called missions to uh, back out to back out to homelands. And so um, they said, no, we don't really want agriculture. What we do need is community development that supports local Aboriginal elders to go back to country and to use this complicated thing of um, government grants and funding opportunities to use that to uh, add to their passion to go back to country. And so, so I got a job as a community development worker uh, through Aboriginal Advisory Development Service. And that's part of agric agricultural science is looking at community and community development. Um, and so it was kind of a segue, but yeah, incredible, incredible. Just incredible I to be uh, a young fella of 25 reporting to a group of elders who were, who were largely illiterate and employed me as their, uh, as their white fella to support their vision and their journey. In fact, they said to me, um, just don't, don't try to be too pushy. Um, don't try to push your own agenda. Just listen to us, learn from our culture, and, and then you know, eventually you'll be able to have a bit of influence yourself, but that's not your job. Your job is to listen to us. And what, a, what a great schooling. Great advice. And, um, and I guess for those who may not know, might be watching on where Mill and Gimby is in terms of its remoteness or access and, and so forth in Arnhem Land, can you just describe a little bit about what it was like living in Mill and Gimby? So the Northern Territory is in interesting. There has been, there's part of the Northern Territory called Northeast Arnhem Land, which is the top right-hand corner of the Northern Territory, uh, home to about 10,000 uh, people who are called Yungo, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a group of nations. And they um, were from the about the 1930s uh, uh, subject to a, a, a preserved area of uh, respecting land rights and culture. And so there was a, a very strong um, continuous connection to ceremony and to, and to life uh, in, in, um, on the land and on the sea. Uh, so Millingimbi is about a population of 600 people living on an island or a cluster of islands, actually literally called the Crocodile Islands in, in English. Uh, and, uh, um, so people had a, not only a way of going back to country, was going back on, on country with four-wheel drives, it was also going back to country on various islands and, and needing investment in transport, included outdoor, uh, outboard motors and boats. Um, so it was pretty remote. Most people's English was their fourth language. Um, it had a, had a cluster of other languages as, as well as, um, as English. Um, and... Uh, and, and actively participated uh, in in cultural life uh, every day. In fact, the uh, Western Western um, way of viewing the world was uh, something that was the Aboriginal people in Northeast Arnhem Land. I don't know if they coined the word, but they certainly lived the word of both ways learning. And living right. in two worlds was was very much. In fact, the um, the word Yorthi Indi, which is the name of the most famous Aboriginal band that you all know, we all know, Yorthi Indi has some elements of, of mixing um, the two worlds in one of the interpretations of that, of that word language. Um, the other language they would use was the saltwater and freshwater people, so that we have this mixing of fresh and saltwater. So there was a great, um, incredible ability. In fact, the people of Northeast Arnhem, even though it's so remote, as you know, Pete, it's a bit close to um, Indonesia. Yeah. And so for the uh, prior to Western colonization, uh, there was also there had been exposure for, to, to the Chinese and to the Macassans for the previous 800 years. So uh, Aboriginal people in Northeast Arnhem Land not only had inc have incredibly rich culture, ongoing culture, but they also have an incredible capacity to interact with invaders, mm, okay. the Chinese, the Macassans, the Western, uh, the sorry, the Anglo's. Uh, it's it's very very interesting to see that that skill set. 
And Dave, when you went out there, you know, as you said, the they employed you as, I guess, the the local white fella to come in um, and work with them on community development. There probably wouldn't be any rule book or anything you could take with you in terms of how do I do this or how did you kind of learn what the best way of of working and being accepted by the community and 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 those lessons of listening. How do you prepare for that? That's a really interesting question, Pete. Um, I think the I was really fortunate that although I was employed by a group of elders, I had this uh, organisation in the background called Aboriginal Advisory Development Service. And uh, that had spun out of the Uniting Church who had had a history in that area. One of the benefits of that was that despite living in community and being immersed, and at times that was exhausting, there was um, a weekly radio sked. Pete, can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> Prior to mobile phones. A weekly radio sked where about eight of us who were doing similar work in remote communities would get together and just have a yarn every Sunday afternoon about how we were going and what were the challenges we were facing. Uh, that's really lived with me, that idea about how do we, we need to live in both worlds and uh, we need to have reflection and a debriefing as well. Um, and I think uh, one of the things I'm currently doing in my, my role at Anglicare NT is is trying to revive some of those practices that allow people in remote communities to do uh, some, have access to reflection and debriefing. What would you have to say to people who maybe are a little bit apprehensive about working in Aboriginal communities or working with Aboriginal people because they're just worried they're going to um, botch it up and, and make, you know, I guess, mistakes in terms of that cultural understanding and awareness, particularly people that come come to the Northern Territory from other states who, who haven't had that privilege and opportunity, I guess, to work with Aboriginal people, what would your advice be to somebody coming up here to work? Uh, well, I think we all botch it up. And uh, that's just part of uh, learning a new job. Aboriginal culture has a, a, a very solid way of supporting people to learn new things, tends to be less trial and error, tends to be more lots of instruction and asking people to imitate the instruction and then um, uh, after a time there's an expectation that hey you should know better but you've yeah. so there's a very generous and forgiving approach so the first thing i one of the first things i did pete was i learned uh, i really embraced uh, learning a language which was okay on that community because it had a fairly common language um, not all communities have a common language or um, and of course, if you're working with Aboriginal people whose first language is English, then there are different, um, different ways of learning. But for me, learning language was a great way of being a, a very humble uh, um, and um, that humble and forgiving experience, really, because people had to laugh. People laughed at me as I stumbled through and corrected me uh, as, as required. Um, I think uh, it's really important for uh, non-Aboriginal people who are immersing themselves in uh, in Aboriginal uh, where, where, where in, in Aboriginal world where where it is a very different worldview uh, is that people need to not lose the sense of themselves. Pete. And so, for me, uh, at that time as a young fellow, I had a I had a Christian faith, um, and I had other other cultural uh, reminders within my own Western tradition of, of music and, uh, and books and cooking. It was really important to not lose my sense of who I was. I have a really close friend who, who, who became deeply embedded in a different Aboriginal culture. And as he got more and more into his Aboriginal uh, worldview, understanding and language, he also got deeper into his Jewish faith and tradition it was that's really important for him to hold both of those and yeah. uh for some people that's that's an important journey and it can be overwhelming to lose your sense of self right. um, in in all the work we do it's not just with uh cross-cultural work we can lose our ourselves and it's really important that we know deeply who we are and mm. what we stand for it does give you a solid grounding doesn't it um mm. if, if you have that as a community development worker out there how do you how do you um start there i mean how, you might have some ideas but i'm interested in the process by how you work with the community to help um you know with community development what sort of projects you may work on whether it's entirely guided steered from the community or i guess again how you 
craft a job uh, out of there which is going to be meaningful, but also um, deliver real outcomes for the people in Mill and Gimby. Mm. Peter, I think uh, community development is a really broad school, and in some ways, it's a it's uh, I find it more helpful to think of it as a mindset uh, rather than a specific set of skills. It is both, um, and so and with a community development mindset, I th it's important to uh, apply that mindset in whatever you're doing. So people who are currently in in a job like yours, for example, Pete, where you're doing as a you're leading a peak body or or a homelessness worker who's doing lots of practical stuff with people in housing you can still develop uh, apply a community development mindset to the work you're doing so for me uh, the community development mindset was uh, as I'm doing lots of practical things and in reality that's what happens in in most people's work there's lots of practical things to do how do I do this in a way that continues to listen to the wishes and perspective of the community who I'm working with uh, and and uh, how do I also uh, build connections between people while we're doing this uh, it's easy for uh, specialist workers to kind of develop very strong bilateral relationships with people but not necessarily creating community so I or constantly in the back of my mind how does what I'm doing here build the links between people as I got into work with uh, adults with mental illness years later, Peter, one of the things that really struck me was that so many people with a serious mental illness uh, have only a, their major relationship is with the professionals that they work with. Right. Uh, that's terrible. Um, mm. and, you know, it's so important that in the work we do in any profession, particularly in the caring professions, that our work leads to people being more connected to their family and their natural supports and their community than they were when they first started working with us. And so that's a community development mindset that has to fit into any work we do. Mm -hmm. What one of the practice, one of the frameworks that I've, I've found the most helpful is the social work framework. So as you said, Peter, I've trained in agriculture and education, but I've been very um, attracted to the uh, practices and the principles of social work throughout my career. And so I've read and been inspired by social work. And one of the fundamental tenets of social work is that social work needs to combine uh, a, a practical support. And so often our entree into people's lives is being practical. And it certainly mm -hmm. was within the work I was doing in outstation, the outstation movement get practical, help write a submission, help mm. people get a grant, help people manage the bookkeeping for that work. Um, and then through that journey, build capacity, build connectedness, um, and then build therapeutic outcomes. Now, that's a big word, but I'm really saying that out of the practical, we get invited into people's lives in a way that might lead to other more sustainable long-term change. Fantastic. And... Um... After your so after some years at uh, Mill and Gimby, you did leave, uh, and you went um, went down south, as they say. Um, what was the decision to leave? I mean, was it part of getting back reacquainted with your roots and your culture, or did you? Were there other circumstances that led to you uh, leaving that community? Uh, yes, it was heartbreaking for me to leave. I, I thought I had uh, died and gone to heaven when I lived uh, amongst. Uh, Aboriginal people in that remote part of the world, uh, it just felt the right place to be. However, um, I was married, we had two little children, and there were um, some health issues that emerged from living uh, in a place that was infested with um, midges and mosquitoes and crocodiles. Yeah. Um, and so for various health reasons, we went south to Victoria and raised a family of uh, a family, and we just chose the town of Bendigo, plonked ourselves in Bendigo and said, it's a really nice place. Mm -hmm. And um, we lived there and there were a few opportunities, a couple of connections um, and got involved in you know, various career opportunities there. I actually initially had a job because I'd been trained as a teacher and was a Christian. Uh, I got a job as a school chaplain in a very um, challenging public uh, government school and got involved in all kinds of welfare concerns. But that really led me into uh, a deeper understanding of the therapeutic work of, of counselling and um, mm -hmm. working through grief and, and, and other concerns. 
Um, and then that eventually led me to work with a, a very um, a beautiful Anglicare agency called St Luke's Anglicare, which did some profound work in the region of the Loddon Mallee, which is the northwest of Victoria. And um, yeah, I ended up staying there for 23 years and um, developing not only therapeutic skills, but ended up getting involved in management and um, eventually the CEO. So uh, I, mean, I love, I love uh, the, the leadership role because it does help you combine a values-driven approach, which is understanding the, uh, the outcomes we're trying to achieve, um, but also the, the uh, great privilege of, of leading others and shaping an organisation. And uh, it's interesting, Dave, that once you start, when you started at uh, St Luke's, it was the same time the Berlin, the Berlin Wall was uh, falling down in November '89, yeah. and um, you've been with Anglicare ever since, in one well, guise or another. That's quite well. Quite there, a... there, look, it's there's about 35 Anglicares around Australia, and they're all different, and they all have different boards of management. But there's, um, it's a kind of a it's an interesting mob. It's probably like lots of other faith-based mobs, uh, organisations. There's uh, there's some genesis there that that relates to faith and values, and so you've got something to touch base on. Um, and that's uh, for the Anglican network. That's uh, often goes back to the teachings of Jesus and. So, but really, universal values. One of the things I love about leading Anglican NT is that the cultural diversity of our of our workforce means that we have Hindu and Muslim staff and Christian staff and atheist staff. Uh, we have a lot of Aboriginal staff um, with all kinds of faith persuasions, uh, but yet there's this common core of everybody buys into the value base that says respect and honesty and integrity and fairness and kindness are at the heart of our work. Everyone buys into that. And, and um, because all of us are, uh, who are in this work are motivated by these kind of humanistic values. But for me, it's been important uh, to be part of an organisation that uh, can articulate its roots in these in these values. It's interesting you say that because um, there's organisations that with a lot of us have worked for, they have uh, values and visions and mission statements. And, and there's this um, phrase, as I'm sure you've heard, called uh, espoused values and lived values. And uh, a lot of organisations can say, you know, we value diversity or we value, um, you know, we want to be the employer of choice and other things. And you think, well, in practice, I don't really want to work for that organisation. And I was intrigued, actually, to see the word kindness uh, as a value. And I haven't come across that before. I think that's quite uh, wonderful, actually, to have a value of being kind. Or can you talk, can you expand on that a little bit about, I guess, what kindness and hope, for example, means in the Anglo Care organisation? I can, yeah, certainly. Um, Pete, I think uh, it was interesting, the word kindness. So about eight years ago, I visited the uh, really impressive Aboriginal organisation in Alice Springs called NPY Women's Council. And it, with the CEO at the time was a woman called Andrea Mason. And she talked about their values um, and uh, which came out of the conversations with their 300, they have, they have a, community council of women of 300 people. So it's a really big uh, community ownership of NPY. And kindness was one of the values that the women of the council kept saying. We, the way we Aboriginal people treat each other is kindness is a fundamental. Mm -hmm. And we're going to insist that if anybody comes into our organisation, if they don't act kind, they're not part of uh, our values. And therefore, wow. if government mob, if government come and want to talk as, uh, uh, to us and they don't talk in a kind way, then they can go out the door. Uh, so they really live this value. Mm. And uh, not long after, a few years later, I was doing a reviewing our strategic plan and uh, I, I use an approach which is very much a grounded theory approach, which says, what, what is our experience? What are people experiencing in this organisation? And so when we reflected on our values and how do people experience life within Anglicare NT, uh, the cons one of the most consistent feedback was we experience kindness and compassion. Um, and um, look, some people even use the word love, Pete, and uh, it's not a kind of cool in most organisations to, to talk about love. Yeah. But actually, and you know, love's been a bit, you know, 
probably fluffed up a bit and uh, romanticized, but people came back to this idea that there's something about, it goes beyond just being professional and being um, courageous and all the other things that we might think about. There's it goes something beyond being human. It goes beyond being empathetic as well. It, it does, yeah. There's something beyond that. And so people said, this is what we experience here. And so by um, putting that, naming that as a value of the organisation, we're simply saying what people are experiencing. But it does mean we can then keep reinforcing it and reflecting how was this practice kind. Um, the challenge with kindness as a value in an organisation is you also have to be, you want to be robust and speak the truth. And you have to name when things are challenging, but we can do that in a kind way. I remember one of our staff went to a meeting with a government department and slammed the door when he left. He was really annoyed with the government department, the way they would, you know, it was about, he was motivated by the client's experience. Um, and then there's someone from the senior, the senior person of that government rang me and said, look, do you know that this staff member of yours really got cranky and slammed the door? Um, and so I went and had a chat to that staff member and said, look, I understand you're motivated advocating for the people you work with. Uh, but if you want to work in this organisation, you do need to do that in a way that also fits with our values and kindness is part of that. So you need to find a way to advocate that also is, um, is kind. Um, and that was a, that was just a choice. So I said, go somewhere else if you want to do the door slamming type of advocacy. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way we do it here. It's a value I think that a lot of people would uh, understand. It's not mm. um, it's it's not hard to understand kindness, but it's probably harder for some people to to live by it and to demonstrate. It. And it does have a very clear, uh, I guess, delineation between what's acceptable and what's not. And it must um, must be quite amazing, I would imagine, working in an organisation and that people are constantly reminded that, yeah, we need to be kind. We need to have that that kindness, demonstrate that in the work that we do. Mm. Dave, I'd just like to um, touch on a couple of things. You did come back to Northern Territory, of course, and I'll come to that in a moment. But uh, in the in those years when you were with Anglicare at St Luke's, um, you completed some, um, did quite a bit of work in the education front, um, You including going over to the UK uh, to do... Um, work at the Holt International Business School to just do a uh, leadership program over there. So it seems to me that, and also you've done the Australian Institute of Company Directors and some other work in management theory. So it seems to me that although you have that passion in social work and you've also been, uh, I guess, quite interested in how to run an organisation or how businesses work. Do you want to talk through that a little bit? Uh, look, I th yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, I think leadership's really important and, and management's really important. And they're both skills that aren't necessarily uh, the focus of a lot of our therapeutic work. So when we're learning what really great case management is or good therapeutic work or good community development work, uh, we, we, de we delve deeply into that. And I love it that our practitioners and people who work in the human services really develop very professional skills. And, you know, a professional is a person who's, who thinks deeply, has a, has a framework for decision-making. They're not just going on their gut feeling. And, uh, and they have a, um, a, and they implement through uh, often tools their, their goals to, um, to, to have an impact. So professionalism is important. And I really... Um, focus as within the organization about what is our professional development for all of our practitioners and all of our workers. Um, so is there a consistent uh, fundamental uh, platform of training for all workers? So take that to the next level, actually within an organization, uh, and again, going back to the social work framework, typically in an organization, uh, the social work framework says you would have about six supervisees for every supervisor. So that means a one out, at least one out of six people is, um, is a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So here we've got suddenly we're going from what's an incredible set of professional skills as a therapist, et cetera, to what are the skills needed to be a leader and a supervisor and then as a manager and, uh, and then as a CEO. 
So I guess I'm really interested in balancing both that we have to, if we're seriously about being professionals at the practice level, I have to be just as serious about being a professional as a leader and therefore develop the skill sets, do the training, do the AOCD course, do a master's in business, all of those type of training are about saying to the people we work with, we value you so much that not only are our, profession, our, our, our case workers professional, their leaders are also professional. And that experience in education would have put you in good stead when the opportunity came up in Darwin with Anglicare NT. How did that come about? What, what made you think uh, you'd like to return to the NT to take on the role that you're currently in? Uh, well, Pete, I'll get, let you in on a secret. This is the, the Dave Pugh career advice. Uh, uh, what I use is when I'm thinking about what I need to do next, I think about who's doing the job that I'd like and how would I get to that job? Um, it's, maybe it's my concrete thinking, but I do need to see it before I can do it. So okay. um, I've done that a few times in my life. I've said, gee, that person, that's a really nice job they're doing. I'd like something like that. Mm. So I did uh, when, I, when my um, children all left home and I was ready to come back to the Northern Territory. I felt like there was unfinished business here and I wanted to make a contribution uh, up in the Northern Territory again. Um, I looked around and thought, whose job would I like? And I approached the CEO of Anglicare NT and said, hey, um, Ian, I'd, I'd really like your job. And he said, well, I'm not going anywhere. And, uh, but a few weeks later, he, uh, he and his family decided to relocate. And um, so the job was available and I grabbed it. You're obviously a very influential person, Dave. He knew his time was up. <laughs> no, it was just coincidences. <laughs> No, that's great. That's a great story. And um, be, I guess being able to see something helps you to, I guess, get a more realistic perception also of what's involved rather than, I guess, uh, visualising when you just have a blank canvas, when you, when, you, when you know what a job is and you can see a, a concrete job, it does make it more real, doesn't it, in terms of... Well, look, it's, a, it's a great principle of our practice as well. So you can't be what you can't see. Yep. And so it's so important that the work that we're doing in the Northern Territory, a high percentage of the clients... We work with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's absolutely critical that our workforce reflects that. We have to continually work on increasing our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce. Uh, it's really important. I'm wearing, um, you can't see it, but I'm wearing my Headspace shirt because Anglicare NT runs three Headspace services across the Northern Territory. Um, that's a beautiful service for young people. You know, our Headspace service in Darwin has the highest, uh, has the largest youth group for LGBTIQ young people oh, wow. and the highest youth group for transgender young people um, transitioning. It's just beautiful because it's really saying, we see you, we see you whole person and we want to support you. Now, um, one of the things about Headspace, again, you can't be what you can't see, is that it's so important that we have uh, young people working working there as employees who have uh, have a, had a lived experience of a serious mental illness, and yes. so the peer workforce is really growing uh, in 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 the youth mental health space as well. So, yeah, I, I do think Pete, it's a it's a pretty simple principle to um, to make sure that we create role models and people we can see in order for us to be. Mm, absolutely, uh, and well said. And over, reflecting back on the nine years that you've been with Anglicare NT, and I guess as you're approaching the end of your tenure there uh, in in that role at Anglicare, what are some of the what are some of the things you, you're proudest about? I guess in, during that time. Uh, well, I think um, yes. Well, you've alluded to the fact that I'm retiring at the end of the year, so uh, it is a good opportunity to reflect. I, I'm. Running uh, community organisations is complicated, and uh, be, being a living in a modern world is complicated, isn't it? Um, but one of the things about running a modern community organisation is that the uh, the world has high expectations about society has high expectations about what we should deliver and how we deliver it and the quality we deliver. It's no longer good enough to say, "Oh, we're a charity. Trust us." Um, we, we really need to demonstrate that. So over the last uh, nine years, our organisation is now uh, accredited with nine different bodies, um, 
to uh, demonstrate that our services are high quality and that we demonstrate that by uh, our, our national accreditation uh, obligations. That's been a big investment, uh, a, bi a significant investment in, uh, in IT infrastructure, um, big investment in creating a Aboriginal um, culturally safe organisation. And so growing our cultural uh, practice as an organisation has been really important. In fact, one of the things I'm most proud about in the last three years has been uh, ensuring that we uh, are using the skills that we have as a mainstream organisation uh, to support Aboriginal organisations to grow their footprint. Uh, and in the future, I would see that uh, in a place like the Northern Territory, we need to see uh, Aboriginal organisations just continue to grow uh, in order to deliver services directly to Aboriginal people themselves. And a successive Royal Commissions over the last 30 years into Aboriginal death in custody and Stolen Generation Royal Commission uh, have all said that uh, services to Aboriginal people are best delivered by Aboriginal people. And so one of the things I'm really proud about is the development of a, a new team at Anglicare NT called the Partnership Support Service. And its job is to share with Aboriginal organisations the skills we've learnt about human service delivery uh, and to support them to grow those services themselves. And uh, that's, that's a delight. And I, I really think it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it also, it brings for us um, a real focus uh, so it means our board has had to say, gee, we need to think about the number of Aboriginal people on our board. Uh, we need to think about the number of Aboriginal people on our management team. Um, we need to think about not just doing a wrap, but living a wrap, living our reconciliation action plan, monitoring it. The board monitors that every, regularly to make sure that we're not just full of fluff and and nice talk, but that we're seriously following through. Sure. So that, that are all things I'm, I'm really, really uh, pleased about. Um, and, and some of that, Pete, is, is just having systems. If you say you're going to do something, put a system in place to do it and monitor that you're doing it. And um, what's the old expression, what gets measured is what gets done. It's management talk. But it, it's, it's true. And I think as an organisation, we've been strong at the, our rhetoric. We're strong at saying what our values are, but, now, but we also measure that. And I think what I also take away from that is that uh, it does the, the, the achievements and the work and the, and the programs that the organisation has, has managed to take on over the years doesn't happen by accident. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes, and but it's also having that structure and that um, that very clear intention as to how how you want to um, what, what 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 value you can add in in the community. And I guess, Dave, I'd like to just finish by asking a question that also touches upon one of the values of Anglicare and Tea, which we haven't talked about, is hope. And at the time, as, as of right now, we're seeing across Australia and certainly here in the Northern Territory, a lot of a lot of people who don't have access to a house that they can afford, rents have gone up. Um, cost of living is going up. Uh, Anglicare across Australia and here in the NT have, have done that annual rental affordability snapshot that shows that there's very little stock, if any, that uh, a lot of people out there simply can't afford. We have high rates of homelessness in the Northern Territory and there's a lot of housing that uh, we need to have supplied. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. What, did, what would you have to say to people watching on around the importance of belief and hope that we can end homelessness and we can do better than what we're currently doing in terms of housing and homelessness? Uh, well, as you, as we talked about earlier, Pete, we, you, you can't be what you can't see. Uh, it was really important for me a number of years ago to visit the Netherlands and to see the, the depth to which social housing is a kind of, is, um, is, is, uh, a belief that that community, that society has about what, what does a good society look like. Uh, up to 30% of housing in the Netherlands is social housing. And that's an extraordinary experience. My sister is Dutch and lived in, a, in social housing in the Netherlands. And as her income increased, she 
just paid more and more rent. It was just proportional. And eventually she said, I think I'll buy my own house. Um, but that, that was after 30 years of social housing. I think uh, we do need to have a vision uh, as a society and uh, our vision is really tiny at the moment. It's, it's, it's minuscule and it's embarrassing. And I hold my, uh, you know, great respect for organisations like NT Shelter and to uh, Everybody's Home and the uh, organisations that are really championing this, um, this need for housing. I think it's important for us as an organisation that we listen to the voice of people on the ground. We, hence, as you said, we, we do a rental affordability snapshot to look at, at, at what people's experience of, of rent is. Uh, we listen to that voice. We do what we can in terms of the practice, the casework we do, uh, the helping people identify strategies in their own lives. But we partner with organisations like NT Shelter and others to uh, advocate for, for justice. And that goes right to the top at the federal government and the NT government, of course. So I think that's important that we, uh, it's the other side of, it's of the values we talked about, we talked about uh, kindness, but we've also, uh, we talk about justice and, and fairness. We have to be, we have to be angry and, 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 and sharp about that stuff. And, but it's sharp on understanding what experience of people on the ground. You, you mentioned hope, Pete, and uh, one of the things that you've mentioned at the start of this interview was that there is an annual event in Darwin that Anglicare NT runs called the Couch Surfing Event, which is a celebration and a community awareness raising about young people's experience of homelessness. And we simply turned on its head 10 years ago this idea that couch surfing um, well, couch surfing is a, is, a, is a reality that most people who experience homelessness are in vulnerable housing, sometimes on a friend's couch is the, where the word comes from. Um, and yet we've turned that into a fun event of putting couches on wheels and having a race of 20 teams of young people come together, decorate a couch and race it through, uh, through a particular street in Darwin. What's fascinating about that couch surfing event is not only the hundreds of young people who come together to race, race couches, but the 30 or so agencies who come together to work together to create an event, but also to promote what they can offer for young people and their families who are, who are doing it tough. Um, you know, there's incredible work happening collectively by organisations and uh, it's much more important that we operate as a service system than as individual agencies. And I just love going to couch surfing and seeing those 30 agencies working together. That, that gives me hope. But the fundamental source of hope is in people's own capacities and strengths. And what I love about couch surfing is it's not saying, gee, these young people have, uh, we, 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 we're terrible about how we treat young people. That's part of it. But we're also saying young people are full of capacity, energy, and resources, and relationships. And they've got so much that they can do to address their own challenges. So for me, part of hope is listening to the voice of people and amplifying their voice, making sure that they can speak on their own behalf. Uh, and Couchsurfing does that. Um, and it also, um, hope comes from a belief that people have got enormous capacity to make changes themselves and will do so. So for example, in our youth homelessness work that we do, uh, only about 50% of the outcomes for those young people is because we've found a house that the government might own or a um, social housing uh, outcome. 50% is because we've supported them to think through other solutions to their problem. For some, it might be going back home and, and doing some family mediation. For some, it might be seeing our financial counsellor and working through some other financial solutions or getting connected back to school and, and uh, a whole range of outcomes. So it's really interesting that 50% of outcomes for young people who are homeless can be, can be met through other, other means. That gives me a lot of hope, but it comes out of people's own internal capacity. I think um, hope is not something airy fairy. It is. It is based very much on uh, a commitment to respecting that people have capacity, and it's not our job to create that capacity. 
that's why I struggle with the word empowering. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's something we do for people. It's more, it's more helping people to discover that capacity. So we're doing both things, aren't we? We're walking and chewing gum. We're saying, gee, we can do people, people with the right resources and supports can and can um, can tap into this capacity, but also we've got to, as a society, lift our lift our gaze. I remember years ago, Peter, I went to England to look at children who were, uh, about half of children who were lived in state government care uh, end up at 18 moving into homelessness. And it's just appalling. It's an appalling result that the kids who are most vulnerable, they've been removed from their families because of their lack of, um, you know, safety in the home are now being put on the street at 18. Mm. What a terrible vision we, we lack. Yeah. Um, however, what I saw by going to England was, oh, was, it was a bit of a kick up the pants for me. I saw that there was a group of people in England working on a vision for young people who were in out-of-home care to go to university. And I thought, my goodness, I've never even thought about that. I've never thought of a vision that actually a good society says young people who are all young people should have the access to university education. All young people should have access to a safe, uh, a safe home, um, et cetera. And there was another uh, local government in, in uh, England that made a commitment that every young person leaving care would have a job in local government right. if they didn't get a job elsewhere. The backup That's was... Powerful get a job somewhere, and if you can't find a job, come and work for us at local government. Yeah. I mean, that's a vision. It is. Um, and so I think, yeah, we've got to maintain both the hope, the vision, uh, and that's why your organisation is so important for us, and then the, the internal capacity that people have. Thanks, Dave. And I guess uh, one thing also, just in, in conclusion, just like to note, I think that you use that word anger, and I think it's not it's not um, contradictory to talking about kindness and hope because we need a degree of anger and urgency to achieve change and to have a better world. So they're not um, they're not contradictory. They they can go hand in hand and still you can be angry or dissatisfied with a situation and say, look, this isn't acceptable. With passion um, doesn't mean that um, it's uh, not demonstrating kindness uh, in in the process. So. Um, thank you so much, Dave, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. There have been uh, a lot of really uh, good insights and some profound things that have come up there. And um, I'd like to wish you well with your remaining time in Anglicare NT. Yeah, we've been very lucky having you in the Northern Territory for, for such a long time and, and for making the difference that you have and for the work that your team continues to do at Anglicare NT. So thanks again. Thanks, for Peter. That was a great conversation. You've been uh, listening and watching uh, Dave Pugh, the Chief Executive Officer at Anglicare NT. And it's the, the episode is uh, Sharing the Couch, which is available on our YouTube channel, NT Shelter's YouTube channel. Please go on, check out previous episodes that you may have missed, subscribe, and get notifications about future episodes coming through. Thank you very much and have a great day.